what God asks us to do or to meet his standards, we cannot do that. God is holy. He calls us to be holy. God is righteous. He calls us to be right with him. God is just. He asks us to be, right, to be just. But Ephesians 2, we say that we read that we all, we all, and when he says we all, it means everyone. Regardless of whether we got born again on the first second when, we, uh, when our mothers gave birth to us, or we just got born again yesterday, or just a few seconds um, ago, we all once lived in the passions of our flesh. Regardless of how, ma- how much time you spent in church, regardless of your background, we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, unlike the rest of mankind. When we understand this, that we once were once lived in the passions of our flesh, then all we can do is to look to Jesus who makes us right with him. And his resurrection proves that then we are justified in Christ. Continues to, we continue to read in verse 4, but God so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is It is only by grace, by God's grace, that you have been saved, not by works, by his grace. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Jesus Christ. Picture this. We are standing in front of a God who is just. He's the one who who is judging us. He's a just judge. And he's opening up our files and he's reading our sins because we are sinful men, I included. And he's reading our past, our present, and our future sins. And we stand to be condemned because we know everything that we've we've been doing. So his wrath, his anger, and everything that he hates, because God hates sin, and no sin goes unpunished, is about, he's about to condemn us. And he's about to tell us that we are to die. Because he will not sweep sin under the carpet. He has to punish sin, either through death, in hell, or either through his son, Jesus Christ. So he's ready to condemn us, and we are ready to be condemned. There's nothing that we can do by ourselves to convince God otherwise. But Jesus Christ sit on me, and I will take my righteousness, I will take my just and my holiness and place it on them. That is what we mean. That's a beautiful exchange, and that's what we mean when you talk about the justification of uh, our own justification through faith in Jesus Christ. It can only happen through our faith in Jesus Christ. So whenever we feel condemned, the Bible tells us there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus because our faith is in Jesus Christ. There is no need for us to try and, you know, make God see us as better Christians or raise our hands and try and make God uh, see or notice us because God has already noticed us. Every sin, God, God says that provide, be holy, and he provides his son to be holy. So what God needs or what God requires from us, he's providing for us. He's the one who provides what we need for us to be right with him. It is by faith alone in Christ's birth, work, death, and resurrection, that we can say before God, we are no longer sinners, and our sins are forgiven. This truth should encourage you and me to be very confident in God, who's our Father, that we are His children, we are His sons and daughters. That was one of our memory verses in um, in our spiritual emphasis campaign. We are challenged to respond to this by being so secure in Christ Jesus And even more than that, living our lives in a godly way, knowing that I'm serving my Father, I'm living for God, and I'm responding to this loving God even more. The second way that we respond to this is by, because we know that none of us has worked for this, it's Jesus Christ who has worked for this, then the question we ask ourselves is, why should we compete with one another in the family of, in the body of Christ? 
Why shouldn't we then collaborate with one another and move together as one and just say, you are my brother and you are my sister. There's no need for us to be enemies. We are moving towards the same direction. We've been saved by one God, and it is one God who has justified us. It calls us to live as united. The third thing, as united people, and the third thing that we are called to do is to take care and reach out to the unbelievers. There are brothers and sisters who have not yet put their faith in Jesus Christ. And it takes you a second because justification is, is it's, it's a sudden thing that happens. That we can preach and we can reach out to our brothers and sisters who are not yet saved. And we can say to them, you can be justified if you just put your faith in Jesus Christ. And once you are made right with God. Amen. For us not to be self-righteous, for us not to look at, at our, our, the unbelievers in a way that they deserve hell and they deserve the wrath of God. But we are convincing them and we are telling them of the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Second and third century defense of Christianity. We read a beautiful passage and read it that God did not hate us. He did not hate us or reject us or bear a grudge against us. Instead, he was patient and forbearing in his mercy. He took upon himself our sins. He himself gave up his own son as a ransom for us, the holy one for the lawless, the guiltless for the guilty, the just for the unjust, the incorruptible for the corruptible, the immortal for the mortal. For what else but his righteousness could have done? Jesus Christ, while the righteousness of one shall justify many sinners. And that is you and me. The resurrection of Jesus Christ confirms that, God, that Jesus Christ is God. And number two, it confirms our justification through Jesus Christ. So are you living your life trying, are we living our lives trying to do all we can to be accepted by God? Do you sometimes feel like you have to try and outdo each other so that you can feel like you're meeting God's standards? The resurrection of Jesus Christ is confirming, is confirming something else. It's confirming that we are all equal before God, and God loves us all. He has given us the same gift, the gift of justification. It's, not a, it's a gift for those who are guilty. Did you walk here today feeling condemned by shame, by shame or you're just feeling that God, God does not love me anymore because of what I've done, and there's something that I need to do. I need to either give out money or I need to do something extra so that God can allow me or accept me. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is teaching us something else, that he has allowed us in his presence. Jesus Christ has made us right with his Father, who is God. The third thing that confirms our resurrection is eternal life. It confirms our resurrection. That is eternal life. Now, the main opening from Paul in verse 12 that we had read earlier the main question that Paul is asking, he says, now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? How? Continues to say in verse 20 to 24, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruit, he confirms that Christ has been raised from the dead because of what we said earlier. The scriptures confirm that. The witnesses confirm that. Um, at least in 1 Corinthians 15, there are very many other things that confirm that we, that Jesus Christ has resurrected. So he says, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by, for, for as by a man came death, by a man has also come the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Now, when Paul says that Christ has become the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep or those who have died, what he simply means is that he is our entrance fee to the resurrection. He's simply saying that Jesus Christ has paid our admission fee to the resurrection. His resurrection, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If Jesus Christ is alive, then what that means is that we, all of us who are believers, are preparing for our own resurrection. 
He says in Romans 6, 5, For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united in him, with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we will no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him in eternity. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death is no longer, death no longer has dominion over him. We're not talking about a resuscitation that we normally read in uh, like the story of Lazarus. We're talking about Jesus Christ resurrecting. So it's something that is factual and that is true. He says, we know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion on him. Jesus being raised is linked to the resurrection of believers, and that is you and me. And this is a very, you know, awkward thing to say, especially because most of us here and those who are watching us online have lost their loved ones. Um, and that's what we pray for during our community time here, of people who've lost their loved ones. Most of us are still mourning. We happen to be still mourning. I happen to be still mourning my grandfather who we buried on Wednesday. His wife uh, died in December 5th last year, who happens to be my grandmother. There's something that sometimes we do, not, we do not want to think about it. But what Jesus Christ is telling us today is that don't think about the past only. Don't think about the present only. Also think about the future. That the people who have left us and they are believers, one day they will be resurrected with him. If we prepare ourselves well, then we are going to rise um, and to be alive with him one day. Now think about it like this. If we are able to plan for our budgets every month, if we are able to plan for um, our children education fund, either yearly or five years, we are able to plan for where they are going to go for their university education, we are able to plan for our own retirement, or we are able to plan for a life assurance, we have that life assurance covered, then what is so difficult about planning for eternity? That is what Paul is asking us and telling us here. Later on he says, if Jesus Christ is not raised, um, is not alive, and we are saying that he did not rise from the dead, let, then let's drink, let's make merry, and let's live like people who have no tomorrow. What is challenging us here today is to say, you know, I can plan for my eternity. Death can either be a scary thing or it can be something that we look forward to. A friend of mine likes making a bad joke, I believe, depending on how we look at it. But he says every birthday is a time for us to look forward to our death and not our birth. It just gives us a different perspective that you're celebrating your day when we near our grave. Because it gives us perspective that we are going to meet Christ Jesus. It's, it's a good thing for the believers. It's a scary thing for the non-believers. And it challenges us to live lives that are right. C.S. Lewis commented that if you read history, you will find that the Christians who did most, of the present, most for the present world were just those who thought most of the next world teaches us to think about the next world more, that we are meeting Christ, that Jesus Christ is coming back, and Paul continues to write that um, in the verses that follow, that Jesus Christ is coming back, and he, if he is coming back, then I need to get my life right. I need to live like a person who knows that there is life after death, and that means that the things that I'm holding dear to now, if they are temporary, then I need to rethink about my life. I need to say that I need to play or put more emphasis on what is eternal, whether it's, it's things with, our, with where we work, where we go to school, our businesses, and things about around that. Jesus says in John 5, 24, very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. Very truly, I tell you, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to judge because he is 
the Son of Man. Verse 28, do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who in their graves will hear this voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to live, and those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. In other words, in another version, ESV version, he says that those who have done good will resurrect to life. And those who have done evil will resurrect to judgment. Now, like I mentioned earlier, the Bible says that sin never goes unpunished because God is a holy and just God. Sin will be punished. It will either be punished in hell, eternal condemnation, where will re people will resurrect to judgment, eternal judge judgment. Or we will resurrect to eternal life because of the Christ who we are celebrating today, that he is alive. Where would you like to end up today? If you just walked in here and you're not born again, this message is for you. For you to just rethink and refresh your mind and say, hey, I, I just need to get my life in order. And the good thing is God is telling you, come home. Come home. I will welcome you. Jesus Christ has already paid the price. And if, as long as you say that you have faith in him, you put your faith in God, not just any other faith. Christ is the object of our faith. If you say that I have faith in God, he is ready to save you. As I'm calling the worship team, another challenge that we are given today it's not get tired then to share this gospel. Not to get tired of us gathering together every Sunday in our community life group, studying God's word, having those Christian um, disciplines that we have of giving, studying the word of God, serving God, and living out our lives in a way that knows that Jesus Christ has died for me, he is alive, and he is coming back for me. We're being challenged then to share this message with other people. That's why we are celebrating the people who have planted churches in Teso and Malindi. Because we know that through that, other people will get to know about the resurrected Christ. If you're here and you're not born again, this is an opportunity for you that we have set up for you to say yes to him. And so we are ready to pray for you. We are ready to pray with you. I'd like you to close your eyes today and just pray to God. Ask God whatever he has told you, however he has directed you this morning or this afternoon, to respond to his word because it's his word. Whatever he has told you to do in your life, would you ask him to give you the strength to respond like that? That if you feel condemned, he's telling you that you're justified through my son Jesus Christ who's alive today. If you feel like you need to outwork or to do things to gain the favor of God. He's telling you, you've already found, I've already found favor in you through my son, Jesus Christ. And if you're, we are going through challenges, God again is telling you, because Jesus Christ is the son of God and he is God, and you can trust in that, then he's reminding you and challenging us this morning. That why don't you be steadfast? Put your faith in me. Do not waver. Do not take that risk in life. Do not choose that shortcut or another path regardless of how tough life seems to be because I am God and I am alive and I am coming back for you today. So just make that prayer even as we continue singing to God this, this afternoon. Unajibu Salaba Unajibu Salaba Unajibu Maswali ya dhambi Maswali ya dhambi Hebe sing Salaba Unajibu Salaba Salaba una jibu, salaba una jibu, salaba una jibu, salaba una jibu, maswali adami, maswali adami. Salaba 
Earlier on today, we had even people joining us from the WRC Safari Rally in Naivasha. They were part and parcel of this service, and we thank God for that. For our first time guests, please drop your connection card at the operatory basket at the exit as you exist and uh, go to the visitor's tent which is right on your right. I welcome us to stand even as we conclude the service and I would like to invite the pastors, the deacons, the prayer counselors to be at the front if you need any prayers before you leave the service kindly come to the front and someone will be available to pray with you and every wednesday we also have our service from 6 p.m uh, we welcome you to be part and parcel of that and as we conclude i want to read for us romans 15 verse 5 says may the god of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And Romans 15 13 says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And let's together share the grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and, and the, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. God bless you. And you forgot to say that there is tea for everybody else who joins service today.